Today we are going to go beyond 1D. We are going to have two spatial dimensions at least. We will have X, we will have Y. Alright, we will look at how differential equations are going to look like in two spatial dimensions. How to discretize a function of two dimensions. How to approximate differential operators in 2D. How to solve for it. How to visualize the solution. And also, what is the matrix form of two-dimensional problems? If you remember, in 1D, we get this nice tridiagonal matrix. In 2D, what do we get? How do we construct such matrices? And then, if we have time, we're going to talk about how to solve these matrix systems. And still, uh, recall what we get in 1D. If we are solving an unsteady problem, we convert the o a PDE into an ODE, and we use ODE solvers. If we are solving a steady state problem, we convert the PDE into a matrix equation, and we need to solve that matrix equation. So here we are going to talk about how to solve the matrix equation coming out of multidimensional PDE problems. So, first of all, I want to discuss how do you discretize a multidimensional function. So, this is a pretty simple domain I call omega. So, in 1D, we have been focused on an interval from, let's say, 0 to L. So, in 2D, we, use, we usually use a Greek letter uh, omega, big omega, to denote the domain in which we solve the problem. So in this case, the omega is just a rectangle, right? So our solution, the reason I have said elliptic is because we are considering the case where there is no time. We are just considering a function u of x and y. Okay. And let's say we want to solve this equation in the simplest form. Partial square u partial x square plus partial square u partial y square equal to f of x and y. And f is a given function of x and y. For example, let's say f is equal to 1. How to solve this? In addition to the differential equation, what else do we need to uniquely determine the solution? Boundary conditions, right? I see a lot of questions on Piazza is about how do you discretize the boundary conditions. So boundary conditions is actually a very important thing to consider in numerical PDEs. If you look at some of the complex PDE solvers, like CFD solvers, the, the length of the code used to dis discretize the PDE maybe is that long if you look at the, the code itself. And if you compare the length of the code to discretize the boundary conditions, what do you think is the ratio? Which, which one do you think is more code, more effort, more time it takes to program? Boundary conditions, that's right. And how much longer? Five times longer? <laughs> that's, that's right, it depends a lot. It depends on how many types of boundary conditions you have, for example. If your geometry has boundary condition of different types on different parts of the boundary. For example, in this case, I have four boundaries. That's only in 2D, right? The four boundaries may have different boundary conditions. In 3D, and also in more complex domains like uh, than this, I may have more than four types of boundary conditions. And the boundaries can be curved and uh, it can have other special tricks on them. So, so, the, so the length of the code used to discrete as the boundary can easily be five times longer, sometimes even more. So boundary conditions is a very, very complicated consideration. In this case, let's first consider the simplest type of boundary conditions. Let's say u 
is equal to zero at x y in the boundary. That's lambda. Oh, that's uh, yeah. That's the the gamma. So gamma denotes the the boundary of the domain. Okay. So remember in one D we discretize the function by storing only which part of the function. The value of the function on the grid points, right? In 2D, we do the same. And the most commonly used type of grid points are what we call Cartesian grid. A Cartesian grid is basically a tensor product of finite difference grids in 1D. So you discretize one of the dimensions using uniform grids. You discretize the other dimension also using uniform grids. So we are going to denote the x-axis with the index i, i equal to 0, i equal to 1, 2, etc., to nx. And the second dimension is used to, uh, is we use j. So j equal to 0, 1, 2, 3, and all the way to ny. So we have nx intervals in x dimension. We have ny intervals in y dimension. Okay, so the number of grid points, including the boundary, is nx plus 1 and ny plus 1. Excluding the boundaries is nx minus 1 and nx ny minus 1. Yes? Why? What is a tensor product and why is it called a tensor product? What is a tensor product and why is it called a tensor product? So, so the tensor product in mathematics is usually a notation uh, that is... Uh, that is basically if you if you have a set A, if you have a set B, okay, the tensor product, the tensor product A multiplied by B is defined as pairs of A and B for which A is in A and B is in B. So this this is what what's called a, a tensor product. Right. So so this case. Basically, the set A is all the grid points in the x dimension. The B is all the grid points in y dimension. So all possible combinations. Yes, yes, right. Basically, Cartesian product. So, so U of i, j with two subscripts are used to denote the solution U at x, i and y, j. Similarly, f of ij is used to denote uh, the function f at xi and yj. All right. So with this, uij and fij, we start, we discretize the functions. And next thing is we need to discretize the differential operators by approximating them using only uij's without having to access the solution at in between discrete points. 